Today we're going to talk about wind energy. We're going to do an overview of wind energy. Uh, here's the wind turbine that uh, powered my house. Uh, you can see it's uh, covered with ice this cold morning in the wintertime. <clears throat> Sometimes uh, that would happen and uh, uh, it would either, the ice would either shake off <clears throat> when it started to spin, <clears throat> excuse me, or uh, melt off when the sun hits it. Sometimes uh, wind turbines have dark blades so that they melt the ice off easier. And you need to be a little careful being underneath a wind turbine uh, after a um, an icy night because the wind turbine will throw off pieces of ice uh, in the in the area of the base of the wind turbine. This is there's you know we're used to looking at wind turbines and seeing wind turbines that have blades that look like sort of airplane propeller blades. And there are many different kinds of configurations for wind turbines. This one looks like an egg beater, sort of. And it, instead of spinning around like this, it spins around like this. It spins around uh, so that, so that the, um, this blade spins around this way. Um, and it's called a <coughs> horizontal axis. Excuse me, that's a vertical axis wind turbine. So because the axis that it spins on is vertical, and the ones that, the other ones are horizontal axis wind turbines. So that's kind of the two main types of wind turbines, horizontal and vertical axis wind turbines. And the far, um, here's another one, egg beater type, or, or um, also called, uh, the technical name is Darius rotor. <coughs> they don't start all by themselves. So oftentimes they have another kind, kind of wind turbine. This is called Savonius wind turbine on the bottom. <coughs> and that um, will start by itself, and it will get it spinning, and then the airfoil on the blade uh, makes it run after that. Here's a sculptural piece of uh, uh, horizontal, excuse me, vertical axis wind turbine. And <clears throat> this is the part that moves and, and collects the energy from the wind. And this is the part that um, it has the generator, the wires, and the magnets. And again, beautiful piece of sculpture. It doesn't produce very much energy, but it's a beautiful piece of sculpture. <laughs> and here they are installed. Here's a, <clears throat> I think these are Really, I'd, I'd like to have one, even though they don't put, a, put out much energy, because they just look um, really elegant. And this is a um, sustainability center, I think, in England, this bottom picture here. The breakthrough was how to get away from wind generators that spin. Everyone up till now has been trying to shrink turbines. I first started thinking about this in middle school and first saw the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse. It's the bridge that starts to shake and wobble. The effect is known as aeroelastic flutter. You can think of it kind of like the bow of a musical instrument, the bow of a violin. When air blows across the surface, it starts to vibrate with the wind at a pretty high frequency. So this is the first approach that uses flutter. You need a way to convert the power in flowing air or wind into the movement of something else. This involves just a few components. You have tension membrane or belt. Think of this kind of as a flexible lever. The second thing you need is a way to convert that motion into electricity. That leverage moves this button magnet. We've designed some very simple cost a quarter kind of power conditioning units. There's nothing really too special about the material. Mylar coated taffeta. This is actually a kite making material. There's enough here for hundreds of wind belts. It was originally designed to address rural lighting in Haiti, thinking how can you make a wind generator for two to five dollars? With turbine technology, it was impossible. When you shrink turbines, you have to contend with slick, expensive bearings. We can get 10 times the efficiency because there's no bearings in the wind belt at all. Also turned out that there's just no micro wind options on the market at all. Imagine if wind power is 10 times cheaper than it is now. You can imagine a totally different way of looking at macro size wind power, strips of material that span a gap, you know, a valley, just have those under a high tension and you can cull the energy out of the wind. Harder problems make for better inventions. Those problems force you to think in a new way and can yield new inventions that can serve the whole world, not just developing countries. London is cold. What I wanted to illustrate there is that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of out-of-the-box thinking around wind turbines. Some of it works, some of it doesn't. We'll talk a little bit more about that in this lecture. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> the vast majority of wind turbines look like this. Um, they look like sort of the airplane propeller type. Here's very large ones. Here's 
<clears throat> students from an energy class actually flying a wind, wind, wind turbine blade that they built out of a 2x6, just a 2x6 from the lumber yard. And uh, uh, we can do this in our class as well. And uh, again, in, in the theme of back to the future with, uh, with energy in this class, <clears throat> we've known how to build very large wind turbines for quite a long time. This is um, 1.25 megawatts or, or 1,250 kilowatts. Um, the wind turbine we have at the SL Center is 10 kilowatts. So this is, you know, uh, uh, 100 times the size of that uh, wind turbine, the wind turbine we have. And it was built in 1941, ran from 1941 <coughs> to 1945 at Grandpa's Knob in Vermont, which is in the mountains in Vermont. And oftentimes there are, um, there are unusual um, geographic characteristics of a piece of land that will concentrate wind and that's often a good place to w put wind turbines and they, they found one of these in Vermont and saw this wind turbine there worked beautifully but uh, world war, the, you look at the time here it was during World War uh, II and they didn't have um, access to a lot of um, materials at the time the materials were put into the war effort and so after the war um, you know we had we had we got access to really cheap oil in the Middle East as part of the spoils of that war and um, we just kind of forgot about uh, wind energy for a long time. Here's in 1957, here's a German wind turbine that was, uh, um, you know, experimented with. <clears throat> here's a little ex wind, wind turbine experimentation um, <clears throat> uh, research place in Germany. And you can see this rotor looks very much like a modern wind turbine rotor built in 1942. Just think what, 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 what kind of progress we'd made if we had kept with it. Um, <clears throat> this looks just like a uh, uh, wind turbine rotor you would see today. Uh, here's one in 1958. It was installed on an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico because it was more reliable and cheaper than diesel. <clears throat> Huge amount of potential <clears throat> for um, wind energy in the Midwest and uh, the, the upper Midwest states, uh, you know, starting with Iowa, Wisconsin, no, yeah, Minnesota, uh, North and South Dakota, um, was this Wyoming, Montana, Wyoming, uh, all, you know, all these states, this is the percentage of the total U.S. electricity that could be supplied by the wind power potential in each of those states. So you can see just one state alone here, North Dakota, could do 36% of the whole U.S. energy um, just from that one state. And so <coughs> um, they, they call the, the these, this Midwest tier of states um, the Saudi Arabia of wind because um, the output potential of this <coughs> area here, you can see it could supply legalist electric, electric demand many times over, um, is more than the output of the oil from Saudi Arabia in a year, even as much oil as Saudi Arabia has. And of course, that's going to run out and the wind isn't. Um, <coughs> you, you know, one of the beauties of wind is is when you combine it with solar and here's a here's a graph of Fairfield and I uh, <coughs> uh, designed up two systems that had the same annual output so the they, they weren't the same kilowatt capacity in other words they didn't put the same amount of energy out in a given instant or the maximum amount of energy but over the period of a year the wind system and the solar system would have the same output and this is the variation from month to month even though the same outputs the same and you notice that um, <clears throat> in the winter, the wind turbine, the wind, wind energy really shines, particularly in December, which is kind of the worst month for solar. But then the, the worst months for wind, you see that the um, solar really shines here. And so you put the two of them together and you get a really nice steady source of power. And here's the basic parts of a small wind turbine. You've got a rotor. <clears throat> You've got a rotor <coughs> which uh, spins. You really have just uh, one moving part, I guess two moving parts. The rotor spins and it typically spins a bunch of magnets. So you've got spinning magnets and then um, inside the uh, inside the generator and then uh, <coughs> outside the generator you've got uh, wires that are fixed. And so the, ma they, the rotor just spins the magnets, just very simple, one, one moving part there. And then the wires here are connected uh, through the, go down the tower and they're connected to batteries or connected to a grid tied inverter. And uh, then you've got a tail which keeps the <coughs> wind turbine facing into the wind because you have to always face directly in the wind, wind direction changes. So the, 
the wind turbine <coughs> excuse me has to pivot on the top of this tower so that's the second moving part so there's a bearing here that pivots the wind turbine to face the wind and then just one other moving part here and uh, you know here's a little diagram of how um, the whole thing is connected up so you've got the wind turbine uh, up here you know uh, the blades spinning the magnets making the uh, electricity and then that goes down to the um, bottom of the tower you might have a safety switch so you can disconnect the power to safely to climb the tower and work on it <coughs> you have a, uh, uh, a tower that has wires that help hold it up it's much cheaper to build a tower like this it has wires it takes more land area than it is to build a tower that just stands up all by itself for small wind turbines <coughs> then you have wires that run into the building and then there you have a an inverter that takes the in this case this is a grid tied system the wind energy and pumps it right directly out to the power grid and you're familiar with that process here's a <coughs> wind turbine that students built at MUM you can see it spin here this is a open source design uh, through an organ uh, a website called other power and it's a, a one of the few examples of a very rugged reliable home built wind turbine and we use this to help power the classrooms in the old building for a number of years. And there, the, you, we could actually um, uh, uh, take the tower. You can see the magnet. You know, the magnets are spinning on that disc uh, that's connected to the blades, and the, then the wires are the you know are, are taking the electricity, you know, generating the electricity from the moving magnets. And there it goes. It's cranking up. And in this case, the tail can be um, folded sideways to take the machine out of the wind if we need to take it out of the wind for uh, because the wind's going to be too strong or something. <coughs> and uh, here's uh, students building um, wind turbine blades from scratch. You can build one in a couple of hours if you want to build one. I can help you do that in the shop. It's pretty fun. And then you can take it out and you can actually just put it on a bolt and hold it in front of you and let it spin in the wind and it's quite amazing to see the power of the wind just right in front of you in your hands there it's pretty scary actually um, and this is um, some students who built that wind turbine this is Julian Potter who went on to uh, get a master's degree in architecture and then go on to found another sustainability sustainable living program kind of like ours and um, uh, so those are home-built machines. <coughs> now larger wind turbines are a little more complex. Here's a big wind turbine. Um, the blades spin pretty slow. And then um, you have to have a gearbox because the generator spins at a faster speed. And we'll talk about why that is probably in the next class. <coughs> um, the generator spins at a, at a slower speed, so you have to have a gearbox to match the speed of the blades to the speed of the wind. Small wind turbines spin pretty fast, and you can just have them be direct drive. Actually, they make big wind turbines that are direct drive, too, and eliminate the gearbox. And then you've got a gears down here that, that spin the wind turbine around to face the wind. <coughs> and uh, uh, this is an anemometer wind speed uh, measuring device. <coughs> and it decides <coughs> it's used <coughs> excuse me, by, the <coughs> by the control system, by the computers that control this wind turbine, to know when to start the wind turbine up and when to shut it off. Here's a relative size of really large wind turbines. This was, you know, kind of a the generation of 10, 12, 15 years ago. And this is the generation of maybe five years ago. This is the generation of now. And this is the generation in the future. They keep getting bigger and taller. And this is to, to give you a, a, a frame of reference for comparison. This is the Statue of Liberty, how, the, how big the Statue of Liberty. These are the, the latest generation of wind turbines are really large. And I think they have them up to 10 megawatts now for offshore. Um, some German companies make 10 megawatt wind turbines for offshore use that are even bigger than these. And if you've never um, <coughs> been in an environment or seen um, wind turbines as far as you can see in every direction, I was uh, riding by train uh, last month uh, from Canada back to the U.S., and this was in Illinois. I actually saw a hu huge number of wind turbines in Ontario, because Ontario is the world leader, I mean the, the North American leader in solar and wind right at the moment because they have very um, aggressive and positive policies for uh, promoting <coughs> renewable energy there. They've used uh, feed-in tariffs like the Germans, uh, one of the few places where that, that you know had the visionary leadership to adopt that policy. 
here in North America. And um, they've created hundreds of thousands of jobs and <clears throat> just been a really spectacular success. But this wind farm was actually in uh, Illinois, <clears throat> which has much uh, lower wind energy potential. It's just a few hours from Fairfield, but take a look at it. And you see off in the distance there, essentially as far as you can see, there are wind turbines off in the distance. Hundreds and hundreds of wind turbines. Producing <clears throat> as much power as a <clears throat> small coal-fired power plant. And uh, are wind turbines, uh, large wind turbines like this, appropriate in urban contexts? Uh, there's some controversy about this. I'll show you one uh, that um, <clears throat> powers... Um, this one powers Carleton College in uh, Northfield, Minnesota. And uh, there's two um, <clears throat> well-respected um, small liberal arts colleges there, like MUM. Uh, one's called St. Olaf and one's called Carleton. And they sort of have a rivalry around wind turbines. One of them put up a wind turbine, then the other put up a wind turbine, then the other one put up a second wind turbine. And so they've got this, this little rivalry going on, which I think is a, is a great, uh, <clears throat> great kind of college rivalry to have. So let's take a look at what a wind turbine in an urban environment looks like. So I don't find that too ridiculously um, ugly or obstructive <clears throat> to um, what's going on in, in, the city, uh, in the city viewscape there. And it's producing clean, renewable energy. <clears throat> it wouldn't, it's, it's, it's located in a place where it's far enough away so the people that are nearest to it can't hear it, but it's still in a kind of an urban environment. So let's look at the physics of <clears throat> how wind energy works. The power delivered is related. To, so the way, um, the way that um, um, uh, the, the process of generating, of, of getting energy from the wind is due to the fact that the wind has um, some kind, some mass. It actually weighs something. You don't usually think of that, but think about how powerful that air mass is when it slams a, uh, in a in a gust of wind, slams a door shut behind you. So that air has weight and it can push on things and it can move things. And so <clears throat> the um, what you do with the wind turbine is you actually the the wind speed um, <clears throat> behind the wind turbine is actually slightly slower, just just right where the wind turbine is than the uh, wind speed just in front of the wind turbine. And so <clears throat> what the wind turbine is, is doing is it's slowing that energy down a little, the slowing that wind down, that mass of moving, um, moving um, air, that weight of moving air, slowing it down. And when it slows it down, what it does is, is it's, um, it's, it gives up energy and, can, and it captures that energy. You can think of this, think about a, a heavy weight that you hold in your hand and you um, drop it on your foot. And um, that weight, that moving weight has um, some uh, energy related to its, um, its uh, you know, motion and its weight. And when it hits your foot, it gives up all that energy in your foot. Now, you stop that thing completely, but uh, you can't stop the wind completely or you'll stop the generation process. So, um, <clears throat> but the wind, you, you can slow it down a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there's a, there's actually a, uh, well, we'll talk about the theoretical maximum amount you can slow it down to get the maximum amount of wind, of, of wind energy out of a flowing stream of, of wind. <clears throat> so <clears throat> the, um, the energy in the wind is related to the uh, coefficient of performance, which we'll talk about in a minute, times one half times the diameter <clears throat> times the of, the of the wind turbine times the air. Uh, excuse me, the density of the air, excuse me, that's the density of the air. So it's a coefficient of performance times one half times the density of the air, which is related to the weight of the air, you know, and the area of the wind turbine in square feet or square meters or something like that times the velocity cubed. And this is the one that's really critical. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, the, you know, energy in the wind is related to the velocity cube. So that means every time you double the wind speed, you get eight times the power, not double the power. So it's very sensitive. Wind is very sensitive to small changes in wind speed. <clears throat> now, the way a wind turbine blade works is that it's, it's, it's shaped like an airplane wing, and it's flying through the air. And um, <clears throat> the, the air takes a longer path over the top and a shorter path under the bottom. But you, don't, you can't create the air, so it all has to meet up back here. So the one that takes the longer path has to go faster, spread out more, and then there's a low pressure area and it actually pulls the wing forward, pulls the wing forward like this. 
And so that's how uh, wind, wind turbine, modern wind turbines, the, the airfoil wind turbines work. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at what some of the consequences of that are. One, uh, let me just throw one other out. You notice that the area of the wind turbine is related to its radius or diameter squared. So <clears throat> the area is uh, not directly related to how big it is. It's related to the area squared, the radius squared. Um, <clears throat> and what's really important is the area that's swept by that wind turbine. That's kind of the collection area. That's, the, that's, the, that's, that's what's collecting your um, energy from the wind, the, the, the path of that area that's um, um, laid out by the rotation of those blades. And it's related to the um, blade diameter squared <coughs> or radius squared. So every time you double the um, radius or diameter of a wind turbine, you get four times the power output. Um, so you go from a 10-foot diameter wind turbine to a 20-foot diameter wind turbine, you don't get twice the power and energy. You get four times because you get four times the area that you're um, that you're sweeping with those tur turbine blades. So let's take an another look at this. <coughs> um, let's suppose the wind blows for 10 hours at 8 meters per second and 10 hours at 4 meters per second. What would be the total energy and average power for square per square meter over those 20 hours? So if we look at the energy that's the 10 hours at 8 meters per second then it's <coughs> don't worry about the the um, you know the, the 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 details of the calculation here but it's just 3136 uh, watt hours per square meter so 300 so <coughs> you know if you had a if you wanted to calculate this for the, a whole size of a huge wind turbine you just have to put in here how many square meters that wind turbine is but this is just telling you how much it is for one square meter of swept area of the wind turbine so it's uh, let's say that the energy available at 8 meters per second for 10 hours is 3,136. But if we cut that wind speed in half to 4 miles per hour, 10 hours at 4 miles per hour, it's only 392 watt hours. So the to total is 3,528. But you notice that the ba vast majority of that came from the time at which the wind was at 8 meters per second. You could almost ignore the amount of energy you got from the 4 meter per second wind. So uh, there, you know, there, there just isn't very much energy in low speed winds and you'll often find wind turbine manufacturers um, <coughs> bragging about how much energy that their uh, wind turbines will make in low speed winds but there just isn't that much energy available there to collect really unless you just need small amounts of energy for a boat or for a cabin or something like that um, and here's another way to think about this <coughs> these are equal amounts of energy one hour of wind at 20 miles per hour is the same as eight hours of wind at 10 miles per hour is the same as 64 hours of wind at five miles per hour so a, a little five mile per hour wind would have to run 64 hours to give you the energy you get in just in one 20 mile one hour of 20 mile per hour wind let's do a little calculation with this <coughs> let's look at the wind generator for the sl center it's a bergy xl10 it has a 23 foot diameter rotor that's seven meters <coughs> and it has a coefficient of performance that's this number right here of 0.25. What is the power output of the generator in a 20 mile per hour, 9 meter per, spec, per second wind? So if we just roll these numbers out, we've got a coefficient of performance of 0.25, and this can never be above 0.6. That's called the Betts limit. We'll talk about that. But So this, this wind turbine probably could be improved some, but it's pretty good. Uh, large wind turbines might have coefficient of performance of 0.4, <coughs> um, and, and again, the theoretical maximum is 0.6 times 0.5 times the density of air <coughs> times the area which is pi times the um, this is all in meter in, in meters I guess uh, meters meter uh, units um, yeah this is in, in, in meter units so this is 3.5 is the 7 meter rotor the um, the this is that's the diameter this is the radius so pi r squared times 9, which is the meters per second of wind cubed, and we'll get 4,228 watts. And the typical coefficient of performance for wind turbines is between 0.15 and 0.35. And that has to do with, um, you know, the efficiency, um, something called a tip-speed ratio <coughs> often, which we'll talk about in the next class. <coughs> um, <coughs> but um, let's, let's take a look at what that Berge power curve. We looked at this once before on a windy day when we were looking at the wind turbine, but <clears throat> let's look at wind speed of 9 meters per second 
and we calculated, um, let's see, what did we calculate? We calculated 4,228. And if we look on the, um, the curve, actual output of the machine, that's 4.8 kilowatts. So, and it's just slightly less than, let me see, where is it? It's right at that. So, you know, we're in the ballpark with what we calculated. Maybe, maybe the Bergie has a slightly higher coefficient of performance than I put in the, the equation. <clears throat> and this is what a power curve looks like for a, um, oh, let me go back one here. You notice that the power output doesn't continue to go up um, <clears throat> at the V squared, V cubed uh, level at this, you know, um, <clears throat> really geometric <clears throat> um, level. Uh, forever it stops out here it peaks out here at 12 kilowatts and that's because that's as that's the size of the generator and so what it has to do um, <clears throat> above that it has to actually kind of throw away the rest of the wind power that normally would would generate if it if it was it will continue to go up on a curve like this so all wind turbines have kind of a maximum um, speed at which they operate and after that point they they have to throw away the extra wind power that that hits them in some way in order to survive so this is the wind. Uh, this is the power curve for some large wind turbines. This is um, uh, NEG Micon 1500 kilowatt, and so you can see here that it um, at uh, wind speed of 30 miles, 30 uh, miles per hour, it'll put out um, the or 35 maybe 35 miles per hour. It puts out its 1500 uh, kilowatts, but at a wind speed of 10 miles per hour, it puts out um, you know just maybe 50 watts. 20 miles per hour it puts out whoops it puts out um, um, maybe 700 watts 700 kilowatts excuse me 700 kilowatts and then it and then it has to go up to 35 miles per hour and then there's not uh, th if the wind doesn't blow at 35 pop miles per hour many hours of the day so most of the time this wind turbine is working <laughs> many hours of the year even most of the time this wind turbine is working down here so even though it's rated at 1500 watts kilowatts it doesn't put out 1500 kilowatts very often that's just its maximum peak amount of power <clears throat> and then let's talk a little bit more about this <clears throat> idea of a theoretical um, maximum for the amount of energy that can be extracted from the wind if we look here this is the upwind uh, wind speed velocity here and it's going to hit the wind turbine and the wind turbine is going to extract some energy which will slow the wind down coming out the other side and so um, uh, um, we can't. So you can think about this. If we if we extract all the energy out of the wind, the wind would stop, and it'd be like a solid disc. Uh, the, instead of blades, you'd just have a solid disc there. You wouldn't be able to extract any energy at all from the wind <coughs> anymore because it wouldn't be flowing through the wind turbine. And then if you um, if the wind just you know flows by the wind turbine and you don't slow it down at all, you don't extract any energy. And so this is kind of a curve that shows that <laughs> here's a, a point at which we're um, extracting uh, just you know you know not the maximum amount of energy. We're letting more wind flow through. And then here's a point where we get <coughs> the actual <coughs> excuse me maximum amount of um, energy. And then as we start to slow the wind down more and more and more, we'll get less and less energy until we slow it down completely. So it turns out that um, that you can only extract about one third of the energy. Uh, it, the, the maximum of this whole process, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm waving my hands here a little bit. We'll talk more about this in the um, in the uh, um, wind in the energy technology class next block. But <coughs> what the the net the net result is that you can only extract about a you know the maximum amount of the the maximum power you get is when you extract about a third of the energy out of the wind. And uh, this was discovered by a guy named Betts actually in 1919. And so, so you can't really have a, a wind turbine uh, that, uh, you know, is, is more than sort of 60% efficient. So um, <clears throat> here's some wind turbine design considerations when you're thinking about designing wind turbines. You've got you to have a high wind survival strategy. And often that's by changing the pitch of the blades or the angle at which the blades um, uh, attack the wind. So if you if you put the blades so that let's say the wind's blowing this way, <clears throat> let me just put a, get a pen here. Let's say that the wind is blowing this way, and um, <clears throat> your blade is at an angle like this. Let's say, whoops, that's not a very 
good blade. But what's going to do is the wind's going to hit here, bounce off, and the blade's going to spin. It's going to move. The airfoil's going to take effect. But if we take and we turn that blade, um, let me see if I can make another blade here. Whoops. Whoops, here's a blade. Whoop, this. <laughs> Okay, uh, not a very good drawing there, but so pretend that that's straight across the bottom there. Let's see if I can do that. Straight across the bottom, and then this goes uh, at an angle like this, the airfoil. <clears throat> then if it's this way, then the, um, the blade is not collecting any energy. So you can feather the blade or, or, or turn the blade so it's parallel to the wind, and you can shut the wind turbine off. <laughs> and so you can... Um, and you can also take the whole machine and rotate it away from the wind so that the blades no longer face the wind. Um, you can also, then, then there are, so that's a way to spill the energy. And then once you've spilled the energy, then you can put a brake on. You often don't want to put the brake on until you've spilled the energy off the blades because if you try to put a brake on in a wind turbine that is um, operating uh, in, you know, high winds, it's kind of like driving down the car with, down the freeway with your foot on the gas, full out, and then you slam on the brake at the same time without taking your foot off the gas. So typically you want to spill the wind in some way, <clears throat> and then uh, you can shut it off with an electrical brake, a mechanical brake, um, <clears throat> uh, mechanically rotate the machine out of the wind. <clears throat> <clears throat> it turns out that if you just, uh, for small wind turbines, if you just short all the wires together, uh, just top, you know, connect all the wires together that go to the, um, that go up to the, the tower to the to the turbine, it'll it'll act as a brake and slow the wind and, and slow or shut the wind turbine off if it's not in a very high wind. Um, <clears throat> there are several different types of, types of generators. Again, we won't get that into that too much in this class. There are direct current generators, alternating current generators, permanent magnet generators. And then um, the other uh, consideration for design is how does it automatically face the wind? Does it, does it face the wind upwind? In other words, um, the blade spin uh, in front of the, uh, <clears throat> so the wind's coming at the, uh, at the turbine, and the blades are in front of the tower, so the wind hits the blades before it hits the tower. That's one way. And another way is to um, <clears throat> have the blades be behind the tower, so that the, when the wind comes, it hits the tower first, and then hits the blades. And it turns out, if you have a um, wind turbine where it's downwind of the, um, of the tower all the time, then it will, it will, often face into the wind without having to have a tower or anything because it kind of drags behind the without having to have a tail or anything or a or a mechanism to turn it into the wind but then there's a problem because every time it spins around it hits the shadow the wind shadow of the tower so the tower the wind's hitting the tower first and then getting turbulent when it hits the tower and then it's hitting the blades of the of the turbine so all, almost all modern wind turbines are upwind designs where they um they they they're arranged so that they um they 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 face the wind first and then hit and then the wind hits the tower second. Um, you have to decide whether it's going to be grid tie or off grid. If it's grid tie, is it um, is it does it have battery backup for the grid tie or is it grid tie only? If it's on grid, what's going to be the system voltage? What's the battery capacity? All these things need to be considered in design. You have to select an inverter that will um, <clears throat> be able to handle the power output of the wind turbine and and the and the characteristics of the wind as an energy source compared to the solar as an energy source so they're different you know the the peak power tracking inverters for uh, solar panels don't work that good on on wind turbines without being modified you have to have metering and monitoring um, equipment <coughs> and um, you have to kind of figure out what the distance is from the wind generator to the power use so you can size the wire so these are the system design considerations for wind turbines um, <coughs> height of wind turbines so wind turbines need to be tall they need to be up above the turbulent um, part of the atmosphere and so um, <clears throat> uh, you know you, you have the height you have the height of a building or a or a, um, or a um, uh, tree or something like that the wind behind it is turbulent and it, and it goes to about 20 times the height of the of the object the effect of that and about two times the height of the object and so um, you want to be in smooth winds. Now, another thing that happens with the wind, as it's blowing across the surface of the land, even if there's not an obstruction there, the friction of it blowing across the ground slows down the air um, that's close to the ground. And that's going much slower than the air that's high up in the ground, uh, up above the ground. So you can get, often get quite a lot more. Sometimes you can double the output of a wind turbine by just moving it up in the air by 30 or 40 feet and getting... Um, 
a higher wind speed, slightly higher wind speed. And again, wind, wind speed is energy production of the wind turbines related to the wind velocity cube. So even a small amount of additional wind speed makes a big difference. Again, so the tower considerations, taller is better. You can, uh, for small wind turbines, you, you need to know whether you want to, you need to figure out whether you're going to have a tilt down tower, which means you can lower the tower to work on the wind turbine rather than having to climb the tower. Huge advantage. Uh, a fixed turbine, fixed uh, tower, you have to climb the tower to work on it. Is it going to be guide? Is it going to have wires that actually uh, support the, keep the tower from falling over? Or is it going to be able to stand alone on its own? And another one, is it going to be tubular, meaning like a, a, a sort of a pipe that comes out of the ground, a really clean looking a pipe that comes out of the ground, or a lattice, which would be uh, a tower that is made kind of like the Eiffel Tower with a lot of small pieces of metal um, that are uh, connected um, in, to make a tower. So we've got a lattice tower at the um, Sustainable Living Center. Most large wind turbines have uh, tubular towers. Um, <clears throat> the tower should actually be, uh, this says 20 feet, it actually should be 50 feet taller than anything within a 300 foot radius. Again, the taller the better. Um, you, need to you need to think about um, obstructions and turbulence when you're looking at a wind turbine site when doing site analysis and you have to look at the distance to where the power will be used and the cost for a utility connection. You have to think about neighbors and the people that are the NIMBYs not in my backyard. Um, you know, they love the idea, but they just don't want it near them. And you have to look at the utility interconnection policies. What are they going to, what are going to be the rules and regulations that allow you to connect up this, this uh, turbine to the utility if you want to. And these will be the same, uh, essentially the same for wind and solar. They won't be any different. Here's an example of a small commercial wind turbine that's a grid tied turbine called the Skystream. <coughs> uh, and it has 12 foot diameter blades. It produces 1800 watts in a 20 mile per hour wind. Um, the inverter and controls are built into the tower top nacelles. So all the controls, everything that, that runs this turbine, not just the generator, but everything is up here. So the disadvantage with that is if something happens to it, then it's up at the top. It's not just the generator, it's everything that's up here. But they did that to make the installation really easy because once you, um, once you put this up, you run a wire down here and just hook it to a, um, a circuit breaker in your house and start generating power. And you don't have to hook up any electronics at the other end. In this, this wind turbine, the blades turn downwind to the tower. So in this case, the wind would be blowing this way, and it doesn't have to have a tail because it, the, the blades kind of drag behind the, the tower and keep it facing into the wind. And it'll produce about 400 kilowatt hours a month um, for a, at an average wind turbine, uh, when, at an average wind speed. Now, the problem with this is that this wind turbine, is there's been you know thousands of these installed, most of them on very short towers, and a lot of people have been disappointed with the energy production of these wind turbines. Um, <clears throat> here's an installation sequence. You um, <clears throat> install some concrete in the ground to support the, 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 um, the uh, tower. Then you, there's a process by which you, you put the uh, wind turbine on the ground <clears throat> on the tower, um, on top of the tower on the ground. And then you um, hook a cable here to a, what this is called a gin pole and then hook this to a winch or a truck or something and then pull the wind tower, turbine tower up. So you don't have to have a crane or, you know, one, one or two people can do this. So then here's the wind turbine standing up and bolted down. And then here's the wire going into the circuit breaker box and being connected. And uh, then it's ready to go. <coughs> Spacing in large wind farms, um, you have to, you, you, you can't space the wind turbines too close because they'll be a wind shadow. There'll be turbulence from one turbine to the other. So typically they're, if these are uh, 300 foot diameter uh, uh, wind turbine blades, they'll be five to nine times that diameter apart in rows and three to five times that diameter apart in spacing within the rows. And then the, they'll be offset. So one row, um, <clears throat> there'll be a turbine here and a turbine here. And then the turbine in the next row behind it will be in between those two. So that's just a little bit. There's much, it's much more complicated to, to site large wind turbines, but that's just a little, give you a little idea of the spacing on them. When you calculate the, av the annual energy production for a uh, wind turbine, do not use the average annual wind speed. And here's why. <clears throat> Let's say that um, you've got a situation where you've got the wind blows for um, uh, three hours, and in those first hour it blows for 10 miles per hour. The second um, hour it blows for at 10 miles per hour, and the third hour it blows at 10 miles per hour. So the average meaning you add the, th the three of them up and divide by three equals 10 miles per hour. <clears throat> so um, uh, so if we look at uh, 
um, that, that let's say that, that it puts out a thousand watts at uh, 10 miles per hour, then um, <clears throat> 10 times three is 3000 kilowatt hours is what's going to put out. Now let's say that um, it spins the, the wind, the, another scenario where the wind uh, blows at 30 miles per hour for one hour and nothing for the second hour, nothing for the third hour. <clears throat> the average wind speed is still 10 miles per hour. <clears throat> Excuse me, the average wind speed is still 10 miles per hour. But um, the, when you look at how much energy was produced each hour, you had 2,700 watts during the three, 30 mile per hour wind and nothing for the other three. So you got 2,700 kilowatt hours for um, <clears throat> the energy production for those three hours at the 30 miles per hour and only 3,000 kilowatt hours for the energy production on the first scenario where it's just 10 miles per hour each hour. And, but the average wind speed was the same. So the average wind speed can be very um, uh, confusing. Uh, and you look at, um, uh, for example, the, the difference between the energy in a 10 mile per hour wind, 10 cubed is 1,000, and a 13 mile per hour wind, it's 2197. So just three miles per hour difference in wind speed gives you twice the energy output, about twice the power output. So you can't use the average annual, annual wind speed and just multiply it times, you know, well, it's the, <coughs> the, the, look at the, how much power the wind turbine puts out at the average wind speed and multiply that times the number of hours of the year. That's not going to work. And <coughs> this is a um, <coughs> uh, wind speed duration curve or a, um, yeah, this is a wind speed duration curve. And, and this is kind of, this, this will give you some interesting information. What this is showing you is the wind speed for, um, you know, going from zero to um, about 22 uh, meters per second. And then this is showing you how many hours per year um, the wind is at that speed. So if you look here that um, at five um, meters per second, the wind is there for, oh, I don't know, about 900 hours. And if you look at, you know, um, really high wind speeds when you get so you can see most of the energy is right here most of the power wind power is right here so if you have a wind turbine that started at let's say uh, f you remember, and remember there's not very much energy in the lower speed winds Th they, they're, they're there for a lot of hours but there's not very much energy there so if you started at four or five meters per second and you went up to about 12 meters per second or maybe 15 meters per second and remember there's not many hours here but you get a lot of energy because uh, the velocity cube um, then you'd get most of the energy in the wind. <coughs> um, and so uh, what you could use is you could use this to actually calculate. If you could, um, you know, get this from the weather service or have some monitoring equipment that would give you these numbers, then you could say, okay, um, at four meters per second, my wind turbine puts out a thousand watts and it's going to run, or one kilowatt, it's going to run that way for about oh, let's say 875 hours. And so I could just write multiply 875 hours times one kilowatt and get the energy for this wind speed. And I could do that for every wind speed and then I'd get the total energy for the year. So that would be one way. There's many different ways of doing this, but that'd be one way of doing it. All right, so um, um, so th so you don't have to actually go through all that in Iowa. You can go to. I'm going to change the uh, pointer, and it's going to be an arrow. So um, <clears throat> you can go to the Iowa Energy Center website, and let's go there right now. There's a wind calculator tool, and. Um, Actually, a guy from uh, Fairfield and uh, uh, named Tom Factor, who um, has done really well. He's on the board of trustees now, but he's been uh, in involved in wind power development for oh 40 years or so, and uh, th excuse me, 30 years or so. And he uh, actually developed. He put uh, wind energy monitoring devices, uh, so w anemometers on tall towers all over Iowa, and he developed this whole the initial uh, version of all this. So you have to say that you're going to agree not to um, invest uh, $20 million in the, out, in the r results of the study you're going to do right now because this is just a really rough pass. And so you just say, I agree. Then you get a map of Iowa. You click on Jefferson County for Fairfield if you want to look at what Fairfield's ha what's happening in Fairfield. Then you have to choose the city. 
let's choose Fairfield and then you choose um, the period you want to look at so you could look at just one month you could lo just look at the whole year but let's look at let's look at all the months and the whole year so let's look at all and then let's look at the wind turbines let's look at um, let's pick the uh, Berge XL 10 kilowatt that's what um, <clears throat> uh, we have here you can also you can also um, so you don't have to look through so many different wind turbines. You could look at either small or large ones. We looked at all of them. We picked the Berge wind turbine. We're going to use English units. Let's put it on a 100-foot tower. That's what we've got. Uh, we're going to have one turbine and leave those loss figures and things alone. Then we hit Calculate, and we'll get back. Here's how much energy we produce. we're supposed to produce. It, it estimates for a year, and this is how much we get every month. But actually, we're only getting about 9,000 kilowatt hours. The one at the Eco Village gets about this much. And so um, there's something something wrong, uh, and it's not anything wrong with the turbine. I think it's just the fact that it's not tall enough. There's more. It's 50 feet above anything within 300 feet, but that doesn't seem like it's enough at this site. So we, we need to do some more work on that. But you can see how you could use this to calculate the output from a wind turbine for any place in Iowa, and you can do it for every month. <clears throat> So costs for wind turbines, first off, you have to figure out how much energy you need. A typical home uses about 800 to 1,000 kilowatt hours per month. At Abundance Eco Village, they only use 100 kilowatt hours a month to provide the same or better services you'd get in, in, a, in a regular home. A small system like a cabin or a boat, you only need 10 to 20 kilowatt hours per month. Um, <clears throat> there's a little wind turbine uh, that has a four-foot diameter rotor. It'll put out three to 400 watts, and that, you know, all installed. You can buy them for about 300 bucks, but by the time you put it in, probably 1,000 to 2,000. And um, <clears throat> they're made by, they used to be made by Southwest Wind Power, but somebody else makes them now. It's called the Airax. You see a lot of them around. There's been 100,000 of those small wind turbines sold. But those are only good for, you know, just, you know, a demonstration or just a small amount of energy for a cabin. <clears throat> now, medium system, to get 100 to 400 kilowatt hours per month, you'd have to have a blade diameter of about 12 to 18 feet. It would put out between two and five kilowatts. Uh, the example is the SkyStream uh, Wind Power Sky uh, Southwest Wind Power SkyStream. Actually, since I did this slide, Southwest Wind Power has gone out of business, but SkyStream is still manufactured by another company. And uh, the twelve-foot diameter blade uh, puts out a, a, a maximum power output of one point eight kilowatts, and it costs between twelve thousand and twenty thousand. And then for a large system, which would be um, uh, these medium systems could be either grid tie or off grid. The larger systems are mostly grid tie because it's just so much energy uh, comes at the system when it's really windy that it's hard to control it in a battery based system with unless you have huge batteries and battery banks and all that. It's a lot, a lot of complication for an uh, off grid system with a really large wind turbine. <clears throat> so you'd get uh, 500 to 2,000 kilowatt hours per month. You'd have an 80 to 30 foot diameter blade on that machine, the collection area. It would put out between 5 and 20 kilowatts. Um, one example is the Berge XL, which has a 22-foot diameter uh, blade diameter and puts out 10 kilowatts. And the cost just for the machine is about 35000 With uh, the wind tower and everything else, it's probably about sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 for a complete installation. Um, and you get probably half of that back in tax credits. So what about negative impacts of wind? You hear you 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 if you search around on the internet, you'll find a lot about this. There's a really fantastic movie about, you know, um, questioning, uh, you know, poorly sighted wind turbines and the problems they cause in communities. Um, and you you, you the the concerns are aesthetics. People don't like to look at them sometimes. Noise. Um, it, they, sometimes they make a little bit of noise. <clears throat> Land use conflicts and bird mortality. So. Wind turbines kill birds. So <clears throat> all avian studies at wind farm sites show that bird kills per turbine. This is for large turbines. I've never actually never seen bird kills in small t wind turbines. Um, two to five uh, per year or less, with the exception of a single three turbine plant in Tennessee that has recorded eight per turbine per year. These include sites passed by millions of migrating birds each year. At a few sites, no kills have been found at all. So, you know, wind turbines do kill birds, but it's uh, grossly exaggerated. Uh, you know, and again, this may be an un unfair um, con uh, consideration, but I think it's mostly exaggerated by people who don't want wind turbines located next to them. Um, and if we put it in context, cats kill over a billion birds per year in, in the United States. Buildings kill 100 million to 1 billion birds per year. Hunters, hunters kill 100 million birds per year. 
Vehicles kill 60 to 80 million birds per year. Communications towers till kill 10 million to 40 million per year. Pesticides kill 67 million birds per year. And power lines, you know, there's quite a wide range of, of uh, consideration here. But you look here, it's, you know, if we're really worried about birds, we'd start thinking about some of these other things. Maybe we should, uh, uh, maybe maybe pets aren't such a good thing. So anyway, there's a, just a lot of consideration there. And again, here's just this, this is just uh, putting that all into graphs so you can see the relative uh, um, importance. And you see wind turbines are way down here. There's just not that many birds that are killed by wind turbines, even though some are. <coughs> uh, and um, there are ways in which you can cite wind turbines, and, um, and um, uh, we won't get into that here, but there are ways in which you can even have lower bird mortality with wind turbines and on how you cite them. Um, and uh, aesthetic issues. So a lot of people don't like to win look at wind turbines. I don't like to look at coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, and the big transmission lines that are necessary for them. But people will look at a landscape like this and say, well, um, you know, those power lines are necessary. You know, we have to have the power. And uh, I think people need to develop an aesthetic for the relationship the wind turbine has to the land. And not to say that we want wind turbines everywhere in our in our field of vision, but a few wind turbines around each community, rather than having them all concentrated in one place, I don't think con constitutes a um, a visual um, aesthetic issue. Um, and in fact, I think we should get used to seeing a few wind turbines. And it, the landscape should look weird if we don't have a few wind turbines around cities. Um, wind turbine scams. So there are a lot of. Oh, um, <clears throat> Uh, sometimes well-intentioned, sometimes people who are just out to defraud um, scams around small wind turbines. Here's a uh, <clears throat> picture of wind turbine that I took in uh, Chicago just a few weeks ago, and this is integrated into, <clears throat> so there's a lot of talk about building integrated wind turbines, so how can we integrate wind turbines in? And this is a beautiful piece of sculpture. I really like this. It was spinning when I was there just a little bit, but I <clears throat> would almost guarantee that this has never put out any useful amount of energy, um, you know, more than the one or two solar panels we have, uh, you know, that we're using, uh, experimenting with in the classroom. And <clears throat> you can see that these, um, these, um, this thing uh, has these kind of sculptural wind turbines. The, the collection area is just the size of this um, um, wind turbine uh, uh, arrangement here and at the bottom <coughs> my camera has a really good zoom at the bottom this is the this is the actually the generator so this whole apparatus up here is spinning and this is the generator but because <coughs> it's not in an area where it can get very strong winds it's just not and going to produce very much power and here's another example with these um, wind turbines on very short towers the, the, tur the, air, the energy is going to be very turbulent over the top of this building it's just not going to be a good idea. It's, again, a beautiful piece of sculpture and an illustration of the power of wind and all that, but it's just not going to produce very much energy for the building. Here's another example of the same kind of thing, even though it looks cool. Um, and that's the end of uh, this presentation.